Love's divine Please forgive me Now I see that I've been blind Give me love Love is what I need To help me know my name Hi everyone, it's Ricky Molina From the Ricky Molina the way YouTube storm channel came. I decided to start an educational series of videos on orchestration and arrangement. So what I'm going to do is select some of my favorite songs and pieces and we're going to go in there and try to understand them from many different perspectives on why are these songs so great and what is it that the producers and the arrangers did that really made them stand out. So um, I decided to start with a first song from Seal. Uh, called Love's Divine, uh, produced by Trevor Horn. Now, just some background on Trevor Horn. Um, he's a British producer uh, from England, and he's most noted for working with Seal, although back in the 80s he had a really big hit with a song called Video Killed the Radio Star, uh, a band that he formed called The Buggles. Um, very kind of poppy, electro synth, happy kind of driving, very poppy kind of sound. Totally different from Seal, um, which is kind of amazing. Um, and then later on, after the Seal period, he worked with Yes on an album called 9125, uh, the top 40 hit being uh, Owner of a Lonely Heart, uh, which you're probably familiar with. And then after Yes, uh, he worked on a couple of um, uh, projects with the producers, and he's also noted for some sample synth projects with The Art of Noise. You know, Trevor Horn has always been on at the forefront of technology and how to use it in a tasteful manner. One of the things that really stands out to me over the years listening to his songs, and I always go back to listening to them uh, periodically when, I'm, when I need some ideas, some fresh ideas on, on arranging, uh, especially like pop sort of songs and even some orchestral works, is I'll listen to the way he uses uh, different patches together and blends them together to sort of emphasize a point and drive home a, a certain uh, point. He definitely has a tack, a slant on a song that he does, and he has a message that he wants to sort of bring out uh, with the artist. Uh, so a very tasteful use of technology. How do you become a great producer, arranger, or orchestrator? Uh, well, my simple answer would be, you know, take look at the great producers and orchestrators and arrangers and listen to the, everything you can get your hands on by them because it's by studying great role models that you can learn the most. I mean, you're not going to study someone who's mediocre in a field to become good at something, right? You want to listen to the greatest productions out there. Um, so I would select multiple genres. Don't just stick to one genre. Um, for example, go back in time. And that's the beauty of living in this digital age. We can do that. Um, if you're listening to retro jazz, swing, big band, you want to listen to Glenn Miller, Artie, Artie Shaw, Benny Goodman. Uh, and listen to the way the horns are produced and arranged. Everything from the clarinets to the alto tenor baritone saxes, the trombones, uh, the double basses, uh, timpani and, uh, and drums. Uh, great classic movies. Uh, you know, Bernard Herrmann. Um, and Waxman, great composers for the 1940s and 50s and 60s. Uh, movies like, uh, for Wax, in Waxman's case, my favorite film score is Rebecca. The way he com composes for these uh, very, very dramatic scenes, the music definitely adds to the film. Uh, Bernard Herrmann is most famous for his work with Alfred Hitchcock. So you've got Vertigo and Psycho, how he uses the strings, particularly in Psycho. Uh, with the black and white backdrop. Then, of course, we have um, uh, John Barry uh, out of Africa, um, uh, Born Free, Dances with Wolves, uh, Harry Mancini, um, and then John Williams, and the list goes on and on. Uh, in the 1970s, I like to listen to Peter Asher, who produced a lot of JT, James Taylor. Uh, just beautiful use of crisp, clear acoustic uh, analog recordings. Lenny Warrenker and Russ Titleman, also from that era, worked a lot with, um, with James Taylor as well as uh, Ricky Lee Jones. The Ricky Lee Jones album in itself is just a beautifully produced 
album well-rounded just the use different sonics levels then you have the heavy rock from jimmy page and led zeppelin uh, not too many people are aware of the fact that jimmy page actually produced the first few uh, led zeppelin albums um and he was always there trying to help um, perfect the sound and and come at it from different angles uh, in the 1980s, we have to look at Quincy Jones, um, Thriller, uh, Michael Jackson, for example. Uh, you can listen to that a uh, gazillion times and still get some ideas from that. Uh, Trevor Horn, of course, we're going to talk about him today. Bob Clear Mountain, Steve Lillywhite, a U2 War album comes to mind particularly. That is just an incredible driving album. If you wanted to learn how to try to get excitement into your mix and you're more on the rock side of things, listen to Steve Lillywhite's um, U2 album, War. Dan Daniel Lenoir worked with Peter Gabriel on the So album. That was, you know, the song with Sledgehammer, Mercy Street, uh, So. And then also Daniel Lenoir also worked with Robbie Robertson on a couple of uh, interesting uh, tracks. So, but Daniel Lenoir is more of a control technology kind of guy, very kind of clean sounding, whereas Lily White is more driving. Um, in the 2000s, you have the hip hop era coming to, to light. You have uh, Dr. Dre, DJ Premier, Jay Dilla, and Rick Rubin, who's kind of all over the map in the, in the post millennial uh, period. Um, so in hip hop, particularly pay attention to the way the beats are constructed um, and the bass and the kick drums, uh, particularly very, very influential, influential against the, uh, the lead vocal uh, lines. For a more orchestral sound, look at Richard Baskin and Dave Foster, uh, who've produced a lot of Barbara Streisand, for example. Uh, you may or may not like Barbara Streisand, but you got to appreciate the orchestration on some of her albums. I mean... Uh, the way things work together is just so beautifully and seamlessly, um, just absolutely gorgeous productions like the Broadway, um, I'm sorry, the Brooklyn album that was beautifully produced. That's a live album, by the way. Um, by the way, another really nice live album that I absolutely adore for uh, production um, and recording quality is the Paris album from Supertramp. If you want to hear an example of sometimes the live album is better, way better than the studio album, check out the Paris album from Supertramp. I mean, the drums are, in particular, are beautiful, and just everything just sounds so exciting, uh, as opposed to the studio album, which is, sounds virtually dead to me. So anyways, um, Dave Foster also worked on some Disney Pixar projects. George Martin, of course, is the Beatle uh, producer, the fifth Beatle, if you will, and um, you know or, all the orchestrations that come into mind, Eleanor Rigby with the string section. And then you have uh, someone like George Fenton, who's produced and composed for the BBC um, nature documentaries like Planet Earth, Frozen Planet, Blue Planet, and uh, Bears. Um, you know, he, he's just an amazing composer. If you want to learn how to incorporate uh, technological samples in a tasteful manner again, uh, not overdone, um, but support the ambience of the um, protagonist or the nature scenes at hand, just beautifully done. George Fenton is your man. So once again, to become a great producer, arranger, orchestrator, we have to listen attentively to various genres and styles. And in order to do that, um, I would suggest that you check out Spotify and Pandora and YouTube, and you can do YouTube searches by topic keyword searches and such. Uh, Spotify is great, 10 bucks a month, and you get access to virtually everything under the sun. I mean, we're talking soundtracks, you name it, it's out there. There are a few bands that I can think of that are not on Spotify. So you have like... You know, of course, Taylor Swift and Metallica, who hate Spotify. You have some Led Zeppelin that's not there. Until recently, Pink Floyd wasn't there. Um, I mean, Garth Brooks. There are some artists who just refuse to deal with Spotify. But I think from a composer standpoint, you want to you wanna subscribe because you have access to virtually everything without having to pay through your you know nose for access to different genres, soundtracks, 
scores, um, top hits by you know organ organized by genres and by your taste as well. Spotify will actually create uh, playlists on a weekly and daily basis for you based on your listening habits and they break it up into genres for you. So it's very easy for you to gain access and they will also suggest other related artists along the way. Different, hey, check out this artist. You may, you like this artist. Why don't you have a listen to this artist as well? So basically the point is to just listen and listen and listen again and do it, but do it in a very controlled way. I don't think you can, you should, you know, walk around with cans on your ears for four hours a day. Uh, that's not healthy from a, for your ears. You know, you have to give your ears a break too. Um, so keep your listening under control. A good technique I learned is to like lower the volume to that to the point where you can't he, where you can barely make it out, um, and then just slowly, gradually raise the volume back up to levels where you can appreciate something. Um, in the case where I'm checking out or exploring new new songs. I don't always listen at full volume because I don't really think it's worth listening at full volume sometimes. Um, sometimes, you know, but then when you come across a song and you're like, oh, wow, that sounds interesting. Well, I'll turn it up to like average volume and in some very special moments, I'll turn it up a little bit more. But I'm always listening at reasonable levels so I preserve my ears. And then also, um, if you want to, you can listen on monitors, which give you a buffer of space so that it's not right up against your ear. Um, eardrums. So you want to be able to give your ears some space when you're listening as well. Just some tips on listening. So, and in continuing with our quest to become a great producer, arranger, or orchestrator, um, we have to take a look at some of these songs and pieces um, from on a score reading basis. So a score is simply like if we take a look at some, a book like this here, um, where they break down, um, this happens to be a big band, a jazz uh, book uh, of an analyzing scores. You know, you have your trumpets and your um, alto and tenor saxophones and baritone sax. You'll have your trombones, your double basses, pianos. Uh, there are guitar parts here as well and percussion, um, depending on the song, uh, across multiple staves, uh, different uh, clefs, you know, you have your your G clef, um, you have your F clef, your alto clef, depending on your 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 clarinet clefs and all these different clefs. Um, but not to worry, you don't have to get that. You don't have to let that interfere with your appreciation of what's going on in the song. Don't let the theory fool you. It all comes down to your listening, not what's on paper. Keep that in mind. Paper is one thing. Your mind and your ears are totally different. They're not related necessarily directly. But you can get ideas by by reading scores. Piano roll studies. There's a great website on YouTube. Check out this channel called Smalin. This guy has electronic piano rolls. So he has different colors for different instruments. Absolutely amazing. If you want to, you know, it's mostly classical oriented. So you get like Mozart and Ravel and uh, Rachmaninoff, Beethoven, Wagner, you'll you'll see it all there. Um, just great stuff if you want to really understand how to interchange uh, and assign parts to different uh, parts of the orchestra. Alan Belkin has a couple of nice uh, free courses online. Um, uh, orchestration online. This is a guy named Goss uh, from New Zealand, I believe. Uh, orchestration online is another YouTube channel. Where you can, where he actually goes through score reading examples. So there's a really good one on a Mozart. Um, um, there's on a Mozart piece that is just in itself a, a great study. Then a couple of other free sites to rec that I recommend checking out: Garatan.com and NorthernSounds.com. Notion Six is like Sibelius um, or Finale software. It's kind of like for for transcribing and writing writing music um, uh, for the orchestra. Um, but Notion 6 comes with it um, a bunch of excerpts and full pieces from classical uh, mainly, and you can actually play back the pieces and mute certain sections of the orchestra. So if you want to see how the strings are in violin 1 is interacting with the flutes or violin 1 and 2, or just the string parts, you know, how are they behaving? You know, like the Nutcracker Suite is in there. 
Um, um, you know, you've got some wonderful Wagner pieces in there, and uh, Dvorak, Vivaldi is in there. Some books that I recommend on arranging. The first one here is called Arranging Songs, How to Put the Parts Together by Ricky Rooksby. Pretty familiar songs uh, from the 70s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s um, that are worth checking out. And there's a CD in the back where he actually goes through some examples with you. Um, it's a very well-written book, very thoughtful. You can get some good ideas here on how to bring in certain parts, double instruments, um, how to lay the bed and the leads over the bed parts, um, percussive techniques, um, how to use special effects tastefully. Um, that's a good book to have. <clears throat> and then again, if you're more into like the jazz scene and writing for big band orchestras or for saxophone sections and the brass sections, then I recommend checking out a book like this called Jazz Composition and Arranging in the Digital Age. Um, their online audio um, files that you can access on the website with the code. The code is, is given in this. You get the login and password to the uh, to the audio files, and uh, you can actually follow along how they're uh, developing uh, parts for different, uh, you know, uh, two-part harmonies, three-part harmonies, how to work the brass section together. Uh, with lead instruments and um, all the instruments of the big band orchestra. Uh, good book to have. I'll have links for these two books beneath the video for you. Okay, what do we look for when we're um, listening attentively to these songs? And I would select favorite tracks of yours in different genres. No use listening to something that you don't, you're not enjoying. Uh, so, so pick and choose across different genres some of your favorite songs and let's see what are we looking for when we're listening to these uh, songs well you may want to start out with the melody uh, lead instruments um, what are the main instruments what are the lead instruments in any given scene and notice that I use the word scene not piece not song because the lead may change over the course of the song uh, in different, depending on the scene of the so of the of the song, what are the key supporting instruments in any given scene? By supporting instruments, we're referring to chordal uh, instruments like that are giving arpe arpeggios. Uh, sometimes the chords will take over when there is sort of a quiet part in the lead. Um, so in the chordal harmonies, we're looking at arpeggios, which are chords broken down into the essential notes of the chord. Uh, strumming or sustained uh, string parts underneath. Ostinatos are repetitive uh, phrases that repeat, like dun 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 dun. That's an ostinato. I hear that a lot in chase scenes, suspense, epic type of film scores. Uh, counter melodies, those are simply like if you have counterpoint to the melodies going up, uh, you may have another instrument taking you down against sort of reflect inverse um, in terms of register going high, going low, or intertwining. Certain instruments take over the lead. Um, you know, it's not always going to be the flutes or the first violin that, that takes the lead. So maybe it's a piccolo, um, maybe it's an oboe. Um, maybe it's a cello that comes in and takes over a viola. How is the tempo being driven or maintained? You know, what is it that's giving us the tempo or the beat? Or is there even a beat? Um, <clears throat> so tempo is very important. Um, you know, not just the time signature, but the tempo itself. Are we picking up? Or are we slowing down? Um, what is it that's giving us the drive underneath? Is it a percussive instrument? Um, it could be a double bass, it could be pizzicato, it can be an ostinato part. Articulations. Articulations refer to the different ways certain instruments speak. So in the case of strings, for example, you have staccato, which are short, dut, 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 or sustained long bow notes. Tremolos are kind of quick back and forth. Dut, 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 dut. Trills are like when you're hammering off a string instrument particularly. It can be also like playing the keys back and forth like this, like Mozart. Um, 
Um, so our different articulations for different instruments, why are they being used? Why is it better to use tremolo here as opposed to a sustained note or staccato type note? What is being said? What is the message of, of the overall piece at this point? Are there any special effects that are being used to emphasize a point? You know, it could be the use of reverbs uh, for lead vocals. Um, could be the use of delays, certain kinds of delays on the vocals. Do you want a plate uh, type of reverb? Do you want how many milliseconds do you want on delay? Do you want to do you want to give a sense of space and distance, or you want to give a sense of proximity? Um, if you want proximity, you dial down the reverb. You have hardly any reverb or delay, uh, but you may want to double up your vocals, or triple up, or quadruple them up. Um, you may want to uh, use a sound toys type of plug-in to give you a uh, certain special interesting type of uh, reverberation uh, echo type of thing um, to give you a spatial sense the different types of reverbs uh, that come to mind um, there are all sorts of plugins to do to, to do to present and then there's also s special patches that you can use uh, synth patches that will give you a certain type of uh, percussive sound in the distance or uh, maybe it's very proximate to you how you pan your instruments uh, across it's not just the seating of the orchestra anymore these days in this digital age there's no reason to to pan out the instruments as if you would um, a real life uh, symphony orchestra you know you can have the double basses on both sides these days if you want or uh, the violas on one side the the lead violins on the other um, you can have harps you know or piano parts you can play around with the panning today um, certainly with vocals background vocals can be split wide um, and they come in very forcefully during choruses and then they're hardly there at all in other parts of the song lead vocals are generally up the middle but whether they're front or near or uh, whether they're front near or proximate or far in the distance that depends on the use of reverbs and delays. Um, so all, all sorts of things. Then how do you break up the sonic spectrum with equalization? Do you want the hi-hats loud or do you want them sort of subdued? Do you want the, the S's to come through the sibilance uh, syllables? Do you want the plosives to come out? How about the mid-range? Is there too much clouding around going on? Are there too many? Is it too busy in the mid-range? 500 to 1,000 hertz? How is the mid-range? Is it too clogged up? Do you want to spread it out more? Do you want to de-emphasize the bass relative to the kick drum? That's the, the low sub area. Um, so sonic spectrum um, uh, is very important as well. And again, as we mentioned, space and depth. How do you want to, to create the instruments? Certain instruments are, are near and certain instruments are far in the distance. Dynamics is, is a very important part, um, certainly was for Beethoven. I think of all the composers in the world, if you listen to Beethoven, dynamics, if you want a definition of dynamics, listen to Beethoven. Um, because he can go from really, really, really quiet to, to all of a sudden explosive loudness and then back off again and so on. So that difference in dynamics of, of the level of the volume we're talking about here over the course of the piece. That's what dynamics is. And the producer has a lot to say in all of these uh, variables or all of these factors that we just talked about. One of the things that you may want to do to review these factors that we just talked about um, in this past uh, segment is actually create like a little grid here, a sheet like this, where you have, you know, up here the lead melody parts, um, you have the supporting um, uh, instruments, the chordal. Uh, bed, uh, the arpeggios and such, uh, the chordal, um, the ostinatos, counter melodies. Um, then you have the bass parts, and you have the um, the percussion, percussive parts, all the percussion, different parts. You know which instruments are coming in uh, as the course of the song progresses from start to finish, like a piano roll. Um, you can even uh, make notes on the effects, special effects that are being used at certain points in the song that you want if you're arranging for your own songs. If you're arranging your own songs in a, in a DAW, you may want to use a schematic like this, a blueprint uh, with grids, 
and here we have the dynamics graphed out. I don't know if you can see it, but you can have like the dyna dynamics graphed out over time. So you may want to start out quiet, build up the volume level, get to the middle of the song, have a little pullback in the volume uh, levels, uh, break down, and then build up again to a climax and then a fade out usually. That's a typical path for most songs or pieces. Um, so um, you can do something like this, actually have a grid, or you can use a spreadsheet, which I will provide a link for in this video. Check out my uh, spreadsheet, which we're going to use for our song, which is Love's Divine by Seal, and it's produced by Trevor Horn. So let's move on now to the Excel spreadsheet. Okay, so here's my spreadsheet um, for Trevor Horn's production of um, Love's Divine by Seal. And as you can see, it's quite busy. There's a lot going on here. I've got the timeline here in seconds going on this row right here. Um, you can see in seconds, I have it broken down according to scenes. And one of the cool things I wanted to say briefly with uh, Trevor Horn is that he's one of those producers who actually like considers production to be almost like filmmaking. Um, he's almost like the director of a film. Um, I like to, I don't necessarily think it's based on, let's say, verse one, verse two, chorus, middle eight, uh, break, um, verse four, you know, um, chorus number three, finale, outro, etc. That's more of a structural approach to, to arranging. Um, but here I've got it broken down according to scenes. Um, so I'd like to think of uh, when, when Trevor Horn is introducing a new environment or ambience in each in the song, I like to call it a scene, like you would a scene in a movie. And each scene is different and has transitions. Well, he does the same thing in his songs. For, for each scene is different in its uh, composition as far as the arrangement and orchestration is concerned. So we start out with the song um, with an effect. You hear uh, special effects. You hear thunder in the background, and it's very quiet. Um, and by the way, the beginning of the song is usually usually quiet, but doesn't have to be. And in this case, it builds up gradually as the song progresses. It gets louder and louder till about uh, and then the, the rain storm uh, came uh, break or the middle eight. Uh, two minutes fifty five seconds in, scene five, it gets really loud, and then it quiets down dramatically. It kind of goes off a cliff here in terms of the volume. There's a huge decrescendo which means a lessening in the volume, decrescendo. Crescendo means build up in the volume. Decrescendo means decrease descent in volume. Um, followed by a cesura, uh, which, is, which cesura means um, a stoppage. Um, there's almost like complete silence at this point before the third chorus kicks in, which I refer to as scene six. Three minutes and 25 uh, seconds into the song, you get this very quiet part before a gradual build up again. Um, the build up goes into the, uh, you know, you touch on the chorus again, um, and and then as we fade out, we get the uh, revisiting of the original scene one, which is the thunder and remoteness, and uh, the song ends. Um, so Trevor Horn likes to break up the song into scenes and, and the title and the words for Trevor Horn are extremely important. Um, and they influence the way he produces the song. So we have to start with the title of this particular song is called Love's Divine. Um, so what does divine suggest? Well, uh, to most people, divinity, uh, a sense of uh, a greater force, a god, if you will, a deity. The protagonist, the lead vocalist, is calling on a divine source of strength uh, because he's in, a, he's, in a, he's in a pit, he's in a, he's in a depressive state, and he's going to need uh, support to get out of it. And so he's calling on divinity of some sort, a powerful force. Um, so Trevor Horn plays on that sense of divinity by the use of uh, vocal parts. You notice that in, and there's in the breakdown part here that I spoke of here, 
where it gets really quiet here and the build up right in here is an a cappella choir part you almost feel as though you're in a church in a cathedral uh, where the choir is singing and supporting the lead very very calmly not loudly but quietly we're not talking about hallelujah handle here um, we're talking about a quiet a cappella part in a church-like atmosphere that's at the quietest part of the song which occurs at uh, three minutes and 25 seconds in um, very interesting how the choir harmonies support this uh, sense of uh, cathedral-like feeling and there's also a soft organ playing uh, to reinforce this church-like concept Cause I need a lover Love's divine Please forgive me Now I see that I've been blind Give me love So he starts out uh, in 17 seconds in Verse 1 comes in uh, Then the rainstorm came over me And it's very dry lead vocal there's no wetness. It's kind of like he's right standing and right in front of you, talking to you. And he's sort of sharing with you a story. Um, string pads had already come in, horns very quietly, ambient piano chords as he sings over this. Then the rainstorm came over me. And I felt my spirit break I had lost all of my belief, you see And realized my mistake Not too much going on, not too much going on in terms of the supporting instruments. And then when he said, says i had lost all of my belief you see when he says i had lost that's in wet um reverb uh very heavy wet so he's kind of like gaining confidence as he's telling a story <clears throat> and the message is going out to more people so he's always like he's standing up in a church giving a, a confession or a testimony to people listening to him <clears throat> And then he said, I realize my mistakes. Um, so he's alternating here between wet and dry vocals, depending on what the what the lyrics are saying. Um, so that's Trevor Horn for you. He's paying attention to what the lead singer is saying, and he's adjusting the wetness accordingly. Uh, the supporting instruments, you know, you have um, you have string pad coming in here. Uh, to the 56 uh, seconds into the song. And it gets a little bit of solemn. It gets it gets a little solemn here in, in 50 seconds in, almost a minute into the song. But time through a prayer to me. And um, there he's building up. The double bass is kicked in. Uh, double basses are kicking in. Pizzicato descending line on the double basses. And the flutes are suggesting sort of support, <clears throat> supportive, like we're, we're listening to you, man. We can hear your story. Um, you know, we got ears, we're hearing, we listen. Uh, and uh, it's a supportive, uh, uh, gentle listening to the what the lead uh, singer is saying here. And uh, nice little supporting string tremolos here. Those are not trills, those are trems. But time through a prayer to me And all around me became still I need love <clears throat> And instead of, at this point in chorus one, instead of double bass pizzicato, we have double bass sustain. So the bows are running across the strings with greater uh, loudness and they're they're running across the strings. Um, we're not plucking here. It's a nice support long notes. And once you know, the first sign of percussion that we get is a wood block and it's on beats two and four. 
and it's like a steady little pickup here. It's gonna it's gonna give us some uh, sort of waking us up, like the song is beginning to breathe here. Very light hi hat uh, as well. You can hardly hear it, but it's there. A little bit of hi hat, and then he, uh, then then we get into verse two. Verse two in minute minute and thirty six. I call it scene four. We have a different uh, ambience in scene four. This is where verse two. This is where the drum kit and the bass guitar enter. The electric bass gone are these are the double basses, the acoustic double bass. That is no longer here. It's electric bass here and drum kit. Nice steady beat, not nothing too heavy. But it's clearly like the dum dum. Through the rainstorm came sanctuary. And I felt my spirit. It's more modern day. So we're out of the Gregorian period, medieval period. We're into modern day. This is my story. And the ambient piano chord from the beginning. Come back again, minute 36. Um, interestingly, um, there are a couple of ear candy moments in there. High Moog synths, like, like, like sort of into the distance. A little bit of playness, ear candy. A harp swell here and there. But it's pretty much there just for tasteful effect um, and at the end of some phrases we do have a trombone section sort of to emphasize what he had said when he wants to um, love can help me know my name and that part the trombone section comes in and at the very end of that phrase sort of giving support to what he just said love can help me know my name. I will say that there's some about the lead vocals. Um, not only do you have the dry wet effect, the difference between far and near, but there is vocal doubling going on. Sometimes he, Trevor Horn has Seal's voice uh, at his regular, but when he doubles, he usually goes octave down. And then sometimes he will double up with fourths. Um, so it, it, when he wants to achieve a Gregorian kind of chant effect, he will he will uh, double up the vocal, the lead vocal, with fourths. Um, so fourths is like do re mi fa, so do fa, so do fa. It's fourths that gives you that Gregorian sort of medieval church-like sound again. Um, and then interestingly, occasionally when the when he wants to get the background vocals in, he uses uh, two different forms of background vocals. A choir later on in the quiet part of the song, where we said the a cappella break, the really quiet part of the song. He has the choir, and that's not his voice. That's not Seal. <clears throat> During the choir part, it's definitely like female-oriented choir, and maybe even you know, young adults singing as well. But that's done very sort of panned wide, very gently in the distance of the church, of the cathedral, if you will. Um, so interesting uh, techniques on the vocals there. Uh, I just wanted to say in, there's a middle eight uh, break, if you will, um, two minutes and 55 seconds, almost three sec three full seconds into the song. I call it scene five. This is where you get like a change in the rhythm. It becomes almost like a reggae beat. Not for long. Just kind of like a little bit of up pick in the beat. In the chorus, you have electric guitars doing this. The one electric guitar pan left is doing a reggae beat. Okay, that's pan left. And then you have a chorus, a chorus guitar with guitar fills panned right. Um, the drums are maintaining and the bass are maintaining the earlier beat, but it's just the it's just the um, electric guitars that are giving us this reggae moment there. Well, I try to say there's nothing wrong, but inside I felt me lying on.
Cause I need love, love's divine Please forgive me now I see that I've been blind Give me love, love is what I need to help me know my name That's an interesting part I just wanted to mention here, three minutes and 40 seconds in, when he says, love is what I need to help me know my name. What is he saying when the choir is disappearing? He's saying, okay, when the, when the choir disappears, it's almost like saying, who can help me know my name but myself? Nobody else can help me learn that. I've got to learn to know my own, what is my name? So it's a very self-reflective moment. There's no choir there. They, they are gone at that moment. Very interesting, well-thought-out uh, plan by the producer. Um, then we pick up again, scene seven. The drum fills, uh, a drum fill kicks in and the drums are back in. Electric bass comes in. Uh, and now we're back in move, moving. And by the way, the choruses. I need love, love's divine. That's major. That's not minor. The break is in minor. Bum, 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 bum. And also the depressing moments. But the choruses are hopeful. They're major chords. They're not minor. Very important. So he's like, he's digging himself out of this hole. And he's discovering who he is. And um, like I said, he's got to do it on his own. He's not going to rely on other people telling him who he is. He's got to know his own name. Who am I? Um, and that's that's a self-discovery um, process that is done in major chords, not in minor. You know, we, we have very light guitar acoustic strumming here and there, but it's almost so faint it's not even worth mentioning. But there is some acoustic strumming going on. Very faint. You don't even hear the resonating um, mid-range. You hear mostly the strumming part. So that would be the high, higher frequencies of the guitar. At the end, the last scene is a, is a revisiting of scene one with the thunder. The rain is no longer there, and we're back to the intro part uh, with the with the ambient piano chords. Then the song fades out. A very fascinating song, I, I think, from a production and arrangement. Like I said, this is what makes make seal successful i mean if there is one person i can attribute seal success to it's trevor horn well i hope you've enjoyed this orchestration and arrangement study uh, of seal's song loves divine produced by trevor horn i hope to have many more of these type of uh, studies for you in the future i uh, hope you would uh, share like and subscribe to my channel this will help support me in making future videos for you. I appreciate your comments and suggestions, so please leave a note if you feel like doing so. And I look forward to seeing you in the next video. Thank you. And then the rainstorm came over me I felt my spirit